part, grab some food, say hello to someone new. Um, many of you have heard me say this before, but these networking events, uh, introduce yourself to someone new. You never know what door that's gonna open. Um, create a new partnership. Gordon and I were just talking about it. We've met investment partners, we've met uh, real estate agents, we've met all sorts of industry professionals through networking events just like this. Um, so make sure you take the opportunity to do that. Um, I'm gonna keep the intro brief again, small group tonight. Many of you have heard this already, so I'll try to cruise through um, the Cantor team and a, and a little bit of an introduction to me. Um, and then where we're really gonna spend some time is we're gonna go back to basics. So I think everybody knows this, but we host um, a variety. We host, I think, six now, uh, Pines and Properties meetups across Massachusetts and New Hampshire each, every single month. So from Southern New Hampshire to Central Massachusetts. And we invite guest speakers a lot. Um, and the content of those guest speakers can vary from legal professionals, to real estate agents, to investors themselves. Um, and we've gotten some feedback that some of the topics are a little bit too advanced. And we really need to focus on um, prepping people to run numbers, get comfortable making offers, and really kind of starting with the basics. So we're, we're using this meetup as an example or, uh, to do that. And we're also gonna do that at our virtual meetup in a couple of weeks um, that John Babachi hosts and he's going to focus on this on similar types of content, getting started, running your numbers, and how to get comfortable kind of making offers on your first property. So, um, so we'll do that, and then we're going to have Gabe come up. Uh, where's Gabe? Gabe's here. He is a member of the Candor Realty family and team. Um, just closed on his first property in April, so he'll come up, and we'll actually have an interactive conversation with Gabe about um, how he picked his location, how he picked the property. Uh, and then you guys can ask him really any questions you want uh, ab about about the, ha uh, the property and the deal. All right? And we'll finish up. Um, I know the game's on tonight, but we'll try to wrap up about eight, a little, a little bit after eight. We can sit here and network a little bit longer, um, and then the go sees they're on tonight, so. Really, they, yeah, they're not on until nine. Oh. Tip's probably like nine, 10, time. West Coast time, <laughs> I know. Uh, but we'll do that. We have the room as long as we want, so don't feel like we're in a, in a rush to get out of here. Um, a couple of months ago, we added some sponsors to the team, so we're very uh, thankful to these sponsors. Many of these businesses, we actually do business, we, we did business with prior to launching the sponsorship program. Um, these folks help us keep the cost free to all of you, uh, help us with the food, help us with the venue costs. Um, if you need any referrals, these are great folks. We have hard money uh, with asset-based asset lending, movement mortgage, uh, this is my personal uh, real estate attorney. So if you guys need referrals across the industry, here's some great contacts and you can always reach out to me um, and I can offer your referrals as well. All right, um, and like I said, I'll keep this bit short. You guys can interrupt and ask questions as much as you want, um, especially with the smaller group. I think that'll, that'll probably be a little bit more engaging. Um, so my name's Todd Wheatley, full-time real estate investor and agent here in Waltham, Massachusetts. Um, I lead the Candor Realty Boston team. That's seven agents. We cover all of Boston proper and the surrounding suburbs. We focus on multifamily, uh, flip properties, uh, but investment, uh, investment focused properties primarily. Uh, we will do condos, single family houses, but that's not really our bread and butter. We focus on investment focused prop uh, investor focused properties primarily. I'm also a co-founder with three other partners in Millennium Holding Group, which we'll talk about in a second. This is a real estate syndication firm. Um, we focus on large real estate assets in the 50 to 100 uh, unit range, and we bring those investment opportunities out to our um, passive investment partners uh, who invest in them, and then we operate them for the life of the project. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And I've got a variety of experience in different types of investments um, here, and we have 273, or I have 273 units owned and operated Many of those are with partners through the Millennium Holding Group company. And while I leave the slide with the team up here, um, do you guys have any questions about uh, either my background or uh, the Candor team at this point? I'm happy to answer any questions you guys might have as we get started. Why am I not on there? <laughs> you should be. You should, you, you should be, and you should be like up here. That's right. Uh, and 
I should be much smaller. So, uh, no, but this is, this is the team. Uh, uh, again, investment focused agents uh, around Boston. We've tried to structure the team where we have agents to the northwest and south of Boston. So, whether you're looking for a property directly in the middle of Boston or anywhere around the city, uh, we have an agent that can help you. Who's here tonight? We have Cindy here in the background, or in the back, so she's based in Draken and Lowell, so if you're in the, in the kind of northern uh, suburbs of Boston, um, you can certainly touch base with Cindy. Um, and then, again, we have a full service team here that, uh, that can help you in and around Boston. And Kyle and Lemonster. Kyle and Lemonster. <laughs> Kyle and Lemonster, in a house hack. Because <laughs> that's what we focus on, which is a very good segue. Yes. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so every, every member of the team, the Cantor team, is either a real estate investor themselves or aspiring to purchase their first investment property. Um, Gabe, Kyle are perfect examples of that. Uh, myself as well, I actually was a client of Cantor before I became an agent. Um, and and I, I don't know what the number is. What, Giggles McGee over here, what are we doing? Uh, she wanted to be part of the team, but she's not buying anything. She's not an investor. She, she absolutely can. So we're up, so we're up to th we're up to thirty five agents on the team. I'll put the high court press. We're up to thirty five agents on the team. I closed two transactions in one week for my first time. Hell yes. Hell yes. So so we're up to thirty five agents on the team. I don't know the exact breakdown, but I would say more than half of those folks either live in a house hack. Um, or own an investment property, and then the other half are working on doing that in the next 12 months. So a lot of people ask us, you know, why Candor? Why would I work with you guys? We live and breathe real estate investment properties in and out, like we do it ourselves, and if we can bring value to our clients uh, through that experience, we will do that. Um, which I just covered, so we'll skip this one. I wanna spend a second and again, you guys tell me if this is interesting to you or not. John covered, we cover this in social media. John covers this at our virtual meetup. But we find this as the market is transitioning, which it is, we find the data side of things pretty fascinating, but we know that's not for everybody. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of what we're seeing in the market, and then you guys tell me if you want to go deeper or not on it. So these four graphs are put together by Ian Hogan on our team. He's like our resident data guru. He runs them every month, and he runs them by market. So this is Boston multifamily market data. And what we're seeing is, black, so blue is 2021 and red is 2022. And what we're looking at is trends year over year. So typically in Boston, we see properties sell at a discount or lower than asking price, right? in the winter months. And then as we come into summer, we see things sell at a premium because demand picks up, inventory stays flat or is lower, and we see that, we see people bidding up over asking price. What's been really interesting to see is, as most of you buyers can attest to, like we're seeing properties go over asking price even in the doldrums of a New England winter, which is kind of crazy um, and unusual. And we've seen it peak or maybe P in May. Um, and now we're entering kind of this seasonally high summer period where we would typically see that. So it's gonna be very interesting to see if in June, if this decreases or if it continues to go up. But long story short, people are still paying over asking price and paying premiums for multifamily properties. Uh, over here on the right, we have supply. This is the reason why people are paying more for properties is we don't have any supply. And so we have about 1.5 months of supply, which means if zero new listings come on the market, it would only take us 45 days to sell through the inventory that's on the market. That is like absurdly low. Um, last week in Lowell, John had quoted some, some, he looked back all the way to like 2006 or seven, with like 18 months of supply on the market. So like 10 or 15 times more inventory was on the market at that time. So if, if this chart was zoomed out 10 years, it would be tiny compared to uh, 10 years ago. So that is the driver of the high prices. Is there's just no supply. You can see that again here in the listing inventory. Listings are basically flat and multifamilies sold were basically flat year over year. So um, 
So that's what we're seeing in the market. Any questions on like the transition in the market that we're seeing? Yeah, Brady. Yeah, I'm just curious, the transactionally, what, are you guys seeing a difference on how long houses are staying on the market with like the way interest rates have moved up? Or yes. Not really seeing yeah, that? interest rates are hugely important. So yeah. this, I feel even a little bit out of date. Like this is May data and, I are, and we're at June 16th and I feel like we're out of date. We've seen interest rates, and many of you know this, and if you follow our weekly newsletter, like interest rates have gone up to 6.25% for 30 year fixed rate mortgage this week. That's up like a percent in a week. And so we're seeing real time this play out where buyers are cooling off. Buyers are saying, like, my mortgage is going to be way higher than I thought it was going to be. But yet, sellers haven't repriced their property. And so this, what we're seeing in the market is this repricing is beginning, but it's very, very early. So you're gonna see buyers cool off, I think. You're gonna see sellers get scared, or they're gonna see their properties sit on the market. And what will happen is they're gonna to have to reprice their properties to a point where buyers step back in to buy the property. And if buyers' debt or loans are expensive, their, the fourth, the, their purchasing power will go down. So, but we're in the early innings. Like this is literally playing out. If we had this meeting again next week, it might be a totally different story. Like it is real time playing out right now. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions on, on like where the market's going or not that we know where the market's going, but we do use data to look at trending uh, and try to build hypotheses on where it's going. From buyers, are you hearing anything about, because from what it looks like, interest rates are going to continue to go up. Yes. Are you hearing buyers that are trying to get in before who knows how far it peaks, or have you seen like people back out like yours? Yeah, so uh, real quick, right? So so when we had saw interest rates spike in February and March, we had a lot of buyers step back. They said, interest rates are moving way too quickly for me. Things are getting expensive. I'm going to kind of pump the brakes. Interest rates stabilized. For a period of time buyers got more comfortable they came back to the market so people said okay i can deal with like four and a half or five percent because i know it's stable right i know how to run my numbers which we're going to get into um but when the interest rates are moving very quickly it freaks people out we're seeing that again so we saw buyers come back we got a lot of buyers under contract but with interest rates spiking again we're seeing people take a step back I mean, in my opinion, it's really more of rates are actually normalizing than increasing right now. Now, because we have been at a really low, low, low interest rates that no one had ever seen, ever. Absurdly right? low. So like we were closing clients at 2.6, 2.7% right. 30 year rates. So a 6.25 loan is still actually really good. Yeah. It's just, we don't, we haven't seen that in a few years. So like we're just, it's like the buyer shock, right? The buy, price tag shock right yeah. now. Like I, like I got my first mortgage I got was at 8.9%. Yeah. I'm a little bit older than some people here, so give me a break. But it was a five, you're, you're a lot it, it was also a five, <laughs> it was a five one arm, you know, as well. And it was an 8.9%, right? Yeah. It's like, but like, so it's, it was kind of crazy. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a good point. The normalization, it, I understand there's a lot of fear out there, and I do agree, I think that rates are going to continue to rise, they have to, but I think that it's a little bit more of a lot of fear out there right now. People are kind of just popping the brakes, kind of like what you said. Yeah. And my, that's, again, just my opinion. Yeah. But for every like for everybody that's only been in this three, four years, like you said, I walked in at 2.5. Yep. Sit free. And now I'm, look, like, now I'm looking at houses, I'm like, this is triple what I was paying before. You know? Right, but but what and what I'll say to you guys, and I, this is this is probably unusual coming from a real estate agent, but I'll put my real estate investor hat on for a second. Like, be patient, because what's going to happen is, again, you're not the only buyer out there. But when the majority of buyers say my debt is too expensive, this doesn't make sense. The numbers don't make sense. The market will adjust. It's that's it's a market, and so if buyers disappear. Sellers have to, even if there's low inventory, sellers are going to have to readjust their prices, and the market is going to reprice the inventory, the, the available inventory, down until it makes sense for buyers to step in. So be patient. This is exactly why we wanted to talk about running numbers tonight, because this is the time when the market does these weird things and is the, in these transitionary periods. 
don't like don't don't put your head in the sand. Don't disappear. Put the reps in. Right. Get used to running numbers. Look at properties on market. Know when something is a good deal. And even if it takes three months of doing that, when the one comes up, like you, like when we got yours last year, you're gonna know right away. You're gonna know how to run your numbers, and you're gonna make quick decisions. But if you take, if you go away and disappear and don't run your numbers and just wait, you're not gonna be prepared to take advantage of the opportunities when they arise. But it doesn't mean you go out today and buy something. I'm gonna skip that one in the interest of time. Um, I'll quickly cover Millennium Holding Group. So again, real estate syndication firm. I'm one of four partners in this. We focus on uh, primarily three plus million dollar properties. Um, we have 253 units under ownership that we personally operate today, $40 million. We're looking to grow that to 600 units by the end of this year. Um, so pretty aggressive growth plans. And then we have some sample Project. So this is our very first project up in Lowell. Um, we closed 58 units in March in New Hampshire, uh, and then we have 65 units in Gardner that we're in the process of closing right now. We actually have closed this right now, and we're looking to expand in Gardner and Southern New Hampshire um, as well. So this is a great opportunity. Again, not for everybody in this room, but for folks that are looking for real estate exposure that may not want to be landlords, may not want to operate their own properties, may have family members that want exposure to real estate, um, this can be a great opportunity to get some income, some tax benefits uh, of real estate without having to personally own it and deal with some of the headaches of operations. So. What are the target holding periods for each of this? Typically four to seven or five to eight years. Depends on if it's a kind of a value add play. So like Lowell, for example, this was a, we bought this well under market value, it needed cosmetic renovations. We knew we could boost the value of the property in a very short period of time. This is a little bit shorter, four to seven years. New Hampshire and Gardner are longer term cash flow plays. They still have that, like they still have upside through renovations, but I'll be very honest with you, in this in the fall of 2021, we were looking at the market, we anticipated higher rates, we anticipated the inflation numbers that were coming out, and we said, we want to buy ATM machines. We want to buy real estate portfolios that print money, that adjust based on inflation through rent increases, that we can then take that cash and distribute it back to our investors. So these are what we call kind of cash flow uh, projects. This is a value add project. These are longer term, and this is a little bit shorter, okay? Um, if you're interested, you can go here and join our investor list, and you'll be a pro you'll get uh, updated with new projects that that, uh, that we have available. So, with that being said, um, I want to spend some time running numbers, and we're going to do this live. And I've never done it live on the Wi-Fi here, so we'll see how this goes. Um, but uh, so we'll hop into this. Who here has run numbers on investment properties before? Oh, a lot of people. Uh, do you guys feel comfortable doing it? Do you feel like you still need some practice? Do you feel like, uh, is there any is there any one area of running numbers that you uh, want to spend more time on? I'd be curious to know what you use for like estimating certain expenses like um, property management or CapEx yep. or any, any things where it might not be like harder to, repairs and maintenance, yep. that maybe sometimes like a percentage or percentage of rents. Yep, perfect. And as you probably know, Ryan, like it's definitely more of, a, of an art than a science, right? Um, I want to know. I want to know what your skills are. I want to know for sure, how for you sure, guys do for it. For sure, <laughs> it's like it's easy to be like, "What do you mean?" I plugged in the numbers, and like it just spits out a number on the backside. But it's you know, real estate is definitely an art. Cindy, you were going to say something too. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing that he said because um, I feel like when we used to run the numbers, I feel like we don't we estimate the yep. cap X, but it was more like you know, wanting to get like a higher cash and cash return versus yes. um, factoring in the CapEx. You okay. know what I mean? So we kind of like look for a, a higher cash on cash and then, you know, factor it in that way yep. versus I know we do it differently because I used to do it before. Yeah. So you can explain a little bit. Yeah, and again, I'll, I'll be glad to walk you guys through how I think about this stuff. And I, and I think the biggest takeaway is that for each investor, um, like you need to come up with your own numbers. Like Ryan, to your point, right? I could say like, hey, I'm gonna use 5% vacancy or 3% vacancy. And you're like, 
three percent doesn't resonate with me. That doesn't make sense, right? Like I think I'm going to see higher than that. That that's a personal decision as a real estate investor. And we have a lot of folks that come to us and say, like, give us the recipe. And we're very careful to do that because we think there's a lot of value in teaching folks how to think critically and think, make their own decisions, right? We can guide, we can share what we're seeing in the marketplace, but we can't tell you, we can't run the numbers for you, right? We want people to get comfortable doing that. We want people to, again, what we call put in the reps, get comfortable doing it um, to be a better investor. So. Um, we do have a page, like so. If you after tonight's meetup or late next week or whatever, we do, I have a page on our website. So it's Canada Realty Boston um, resources for real estate investors. So I put this together that has like analyzing a multifamily property. So everything we're going to go through tonight, there's a literally a YouTube video that I walk through this on on this link. So, uh, so you can go check that out anytime. I also put together some other helpful links for estimating rents, um, how to get to the bigger pockets calculator, so other resources you can use when running numbers are, are in here as well. Is Gabe showing us tonight the numbers that he used? Gabe is going to talk to us about um, his deals. So we're going to we're going to quickly run through numbers. Then I'm going to have Gabe Sorry come to talk up. about you like yeah. here. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I was just addressing the presenter. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, and we're, so we're going to have Gabe come up and we're literally just going to have like an organic conversation with Gabe about like how did he run his numbers, how did he pick his location, but he'll tell us all about it because he's right there. <laughs> I have an educated guess, but I don't really know what CapEx means. Is it okay. capital expenses? Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. So it's expenses that are, yeah, we'll get into that, we'll, we'll get into that when we go through the calculator. In honor of, you know, back to basics, like. Yes. Even me, I work with investors every single day, and I still yeah, don't for, know. I feel for, like I don't no, know. No, but anything. seriously, like, ask any question. If I say <laughs> something, you're like, I don't know what that means. Say it, right? Like, raise your hand. We'll do. Um, so we're going to do this live. So, and I also think to the to the point Brady made, we are literally watching a market change in the moment. Like interest rates that we're going to use tonight. I haven't even run property analysis with six point two five percent. And so I think, I'm gonna set expectations, I think we're gonna find a lot of disappointing deals out there <laughs> because the market is going into this price adjustment, re uh, repricing kind of uh, transitionary period. So, um, somebody throw a city or a town out. Anyway, around Boston. Waltham. Waltham, all right. You guys can see the term, all right, perfect. So we're gonna pick a random property because that's how I like to roll. Is this the MLS that you're using? This is MLS. Right, so we're gonna go wall dam, multi dam and property. There's 12 on right now. What do you guys want? Two unit, four unit. Let's keep it not commercial. So we'll skip like the eight units. Let's go four. Yeah, four. Four, units. like four. Wow, a four unit at 829. There's gotta be something wrong with that. <laughs> Let's just make sure it's not like a demo. That's all. If it's like a buy and hold. Look at those picks. Yeah. Okay. I've seen worse. No, that's livable. <laughs> Definitely seen worse. <laughs> that's a good price. I haven't seen a four family under a million in Waltham for. Stay tuned, talk about it. Yeah, let's skip that one. <laughs> <laughs> let's not talk about that one. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's do it, right? So, 24, 26 Taylor Street, right? So, this is the MLS sheet. For anybody that's that's worked with us before, like, you'll recognize this sheet. This is, like, this is the one-pager that we send you guys. Um, kind of has the quick and dirty, the description. Um, if the listing agent is, is pretty solid, they'll put, like, bedroom counts and unit counts in and stuff. Um, so let's do this. All right, so 2426. So I'm going to flip over to Bigger Pockets. Do you guys use Bigger Pockets? Most everybody knows about Bigger Pockets. All right. I have a question about that. Do most yeah. people use the calculators on Bigger Pockets or you use like an Excel sheet? I, we actually use Bigger Pockets a lot, even on like big deals. We do have an investor, we do have, an, uh, uh, we do have a spreadsheet for analysis of larger commercial properties only because they have. 
like expense line items and things that aren't covered in here, but we find this to be very good. And, and frankly, like we'll, we'll run the numbers, we'll print it out, add our logo to it, and even send it to like lenders and banks. And we get more feedback on this. Like, wow, this is very professional, it's very put together. We're like, yeah, we're just using like a free tool that's out there, but cool. Um, important to know, so you're capped on how many you can do if you have a free Bigger Pockets membership. If you want unlimited access, email me and I'll give you our, we have a shared candor login as long as you follow some basic rules. We don't care, like you can log in as us, name your reports with your name, um, but you can run as many as you want. So just email me after if you want access to the tool. All right, what do we say? 2426 Taylor Street in Walton. All right. New feature, it does import property data. We are gonna make sure this is right. So I, I like this feature, but I also I also double check the data to make sure that the property tax and things like that are correct. Uh, if we pop back to our purchase price, 829, I always start with the purchase price. I always run my numbers baseline on, at the purchase price. And then if the numbers don't work, I can always adjust the purchase price down in order to figure out where it does make sense. So this was 829. Uh, what type of loan do you guys think we should use? So four family property, we could use an FHA loan, we could use a conventional, a conventional loan, although owner-occupied loans are gonna require higher down payments. What do you guys think? FHA. FHA, FHA? all right. The fan favorite. Um, Is there a way to, after the fact, look at a 203K? We, you can, so you would use a different tool. So you, you would use, um, you'd probably actually use the fix and flip or burr tool in bigger pockets because what you're doing with a 203K is you're technically doing renovations to boost the ARV, the after repair value, um, and then potentially refinancing out of the deal. So it gets a little complicated to do, do a 3K. It does, it, you can do it, absolutely can do it. Uh, but we're gonna, let's start with just kind of a straight line FHA deal first. Uh, so FHA loans, I think many of you know that have seen term sheets of FHA loans. They're great, they're low down payment, they're not the cheapest loans in the world. They have a lot of costs and fees associated with them. Um, I typically would use, like if I had a client that we were running numbers on in this market for a, a $900,000 property, I would use about $10,000 for clothing costs. Um, if you're super analytical, super you know, detail oriented, you can actually click on this advanced tab and add in each individual item from a term sheet. But for the sake of just seeing if we're in the ballpark, I like to use $10,000. All right, down payment. So we're gonna go percentage and we're gonna go 96 0.5%. Again, FHA can be 3.5%. I think it's a down payment though. That's supposed to be about 3.5%. Oh, thank you. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Paying all cash. There, there. <laughs> it, used to, it used to actually be it used to actually be the loan amount. So thank you for yeah, thank you for correcting that. Um, the one thing to note, and, and again, if you're an FHA buyer in this market, especially in Boston, not so much in Merrimack Valley or Worcester County. It is difficult to find properties, and again, I don't want to go too much into loan, the FHA loan limits, but there are limits on what the FHA will lend on for a particular property size by unit counts. It is a little uncommon to actually do 3.5% down near Boston. You're typically 5 to 7% down. Again, just because the purchase price, the, the prices are so high and the limits are just a little bit under that purchase. Uh, we'll put 3.5% for right now, but just kind of keep that in mind. We'll do 6% for interest rate, and then FHA, anybody know how many points are charged to an FHA loan? Two, 1.75. 1.75, nailed it. Do people know what points are? No. Oh, no. Okay. Are you talking about the mortgage insurance premium, upfront mortgage insurance? Upfront, so FHA is upfront mortgage insurance premium. It had, FHA actually has two. So it has the upfront mortgage insurance premium, right? Which is a percentage of the loan amount. 
points are represent, so the term points are clips, but also used for FHA loans. And they represent a percentage of the loan amount. So Brady is 100% right, it's 1.75% of the loan amount, or 1.75 points. So we can do that. I'm sorry, I might have missed it. I was telling them to stop putting it up. Um, what is that for? What points? Who determines that? So, you know, the, bank. the bank. In this case, HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department. Because FHA loans are so low, they're low down payment, there is a risk inherent to them. Right. Right? For the bank. For the bank, yeah. for the lender. To secure that, they charge a a fee as a percentage of the loan amount in the loan. So that either if you pay on time, you pay that as part of the loan, or if you default, you you still owe that amount of money, right? And so that is a fee charged at closing, but can be rolled into the loan amount. But that's what a point is. Commercial banks also charge points. And again, it's typically it's paid at closing, it's a it's a it's a percentage of the loan amount. It's paid to the bank at the closing. They put money in the bank's pocket, even though they're making money on the annual or the, on the monthly. It's like loan. insurance for them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that's a big metric with the FHA is that it's a lower down payment. Yeah. Very much so. So it's lower down payment because yeah. there are very few, if any, other loan for a four family in Waltham to put five percent down or three and a half percent down. There are no other products. You might be able to use like a mass housing loan, but you have to, it, the qualifications for it are exceptionally tight. If you were to, even if you were gonna live in the four family, you're talking 20 to 25% down on a four family. So for many of our clients and investors, the difference between 5% and 25% from a down payment perspective is huge. Even if it's more costly in the loan itself through the fees and the mortgage insurance premium. All right, we'll do 30 year term. That 1.5% though, that's not, that 1.75, the point, 1.34 point, that would be the point. That's not a finance number though, right? That's up front that data. No, it can be rolled into the loan. Oh. Yes. Still has to be under the loan limit, the FHA loan limit for that calendar year in that county but it can absolutely be rolled into the loan. Yep. I guess that's a good point. So for this calculator though, um, is it gonna show us that we have to come out of pocket with that 1.75% given when we put it in? We Yes, and, and it will, it, because bigger pockets, and this is actually feedback we've given them, it's not an epic, like you can't select loan type. Yeah. So you can care for that in one of two ways. You can care for that either in your, in your you could artificially boost your purchase price you could calculate the 1.75%, you could boost the purchase price and keep your, and zero out the points. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna confuse people, but you could do that. For the calculator purpose. For the calculator purpose. Or you could just run it with the 1.75 and know what your maximum out of pocket would be. And it might actually be lower than that because you'd be rolling a 1.75 but yes, you are 100% right. As long as the appraisal comes back and you cover it. Yes. Yep. That's way later. Way later. All right, so <laughs> rental income. I don't know if people saw what I just did, but what you can do in here is you can switch to single figure. So again, we're going slow. We're talking through each data point. This actually, once you're used to this, this takes like five minutes to do. If you're quick and just want a quick and dirty, like am I even in the ballpark? You can do a gross monthly income number, single figure, so you can go back to our MLS sheet and you could look at the rents. In which, did they give us rents? Nope. Nope, they sure didn't. It's vacant. Tip, uh, is it entirely vacant? It looks vacant in the pictures. Two of them are. Heck, you will apply them. This might actually be bank owned. So, um, yeah, this might be a this might be a bank on property. Um, so it is vacant. So they didn't give us any rents. Can you do me a favor real quick? I don't mean to interrupt. Can you go down and see when they did a price drop on it? Yeah. So is it a price drop? Yeah. So originally listed for nine thirty six. 
$8.99. Oh, this is 20 We actually had this under contract. <laughs> That's good. Dan, Dan Kerr had this under contract. No way. This is bank owned. This is a bank owned property. Yep. Um, so they dropped it to $8.99, which happened to be our offer, and they have just dropped it to $829,000. Why did he back out? Uh, it, there's a significant amount of physical repairs. Physical repairs. Interesting that they dropped the price on six fourteen right when the Fed was raising the rates. Yeah, no, they're trying to they're trying to unload this. Yeah. So let's finish this example. A vacant bank owned property, probably not the best example, but it's still going to get us through the numbers, um, kind of in a in a theoretical, you know, kind of a gets the theory across. So um, how would we figure out if they didn't give us rent numbers? How would we figure out what a one bedroom in Waltham would rent? Google. Rent meter. <laughs> yes. Who said that? Rentometer. Nailed Rentometer. it. Nailed it. Right? So if you go back to our resources page, top one, rentometer, right? <laughs> Boom. 24, Taylor Street, Walt Disney. Right? And I always just, just for, I always just put a thousand bucks, one bedroom, one bath, smart radius, that's fine. Boom. Analyze. Okay, so again, for the sake of running numbers, so for anybody that hasn't seen this before, you're gonna get actual MLS and other, you know, Zillow, Realtor.com, it's gonna pull in actual data from those tools and give us at, you know, average rent amount for one bedroom, median, 25th percentile, 75th percentile. So if we had a vacant apartment, what do you think we should do here? We have a pretty big range here. What do you guys think we should use? With the condition it's in now? Yeah. Lower. Lower than 25th, yeah. Okay. Do so you want to go 16? We'll go 1650? Yeah. For one beds? All right. So, what I like to do, because I like to do it by unit, but you don't have to do this, is we look at the unit and we have one, two, one, two. So we go 1650, right, for the one beds. And then we have two beds. And we go do the same thing over here. Right? So let's go two bed. Boom. Analyze. All right, what do you guys want to use for two bed? 2000. 2000. Yeah. 2000? Okay. I can tell you in the area that's that's pretty low, but you can use it. If it's in crap condition. I don't it doesn't even look like it's livable, but I guess we're just assuming. Hey, that it is. Todd. So like this is a FHA, so it's owner occupied, so a lot of times when I'm running it, I just like put a zero for one of the units. Yes, that is a good point. And actually in the video that I have on the on this on the site, I actually I actually do mention that. So we could do what I would do if I was helping a client buy this, I would say try to occupy one of the one bedrooms. Unless you absolutely need more room, try to occupy the smallest amount of space in the building that you can. So to that point, you could do that. Zero out, owner occupied, um, and then put the other and then put the other units there. But couldn't you choose to occupy the two bedroom and then rent out one of the bedrooms so you would still have a rent for your? You absolutely can. This is where the investment hat comes on. So you absolutely could put. Maybe you wanted to do sixteen fifty for the one bedroom, and then the two bedroom. You wouldn't zero it out because you're going to rent a bedroom for a thousand dollars or eight hundred dollars. So maybe you bring one of these to a thousand dollars. So the only thing, and I don't want to make this too complicated, for the self-sufficiency test, I don't think they're going to allow you to take rent for your unit, right? They are not. They're they are going to they're not going to care. They're going to look. Well, at this seven, is, yeah, that's true. Yep. They're they're going to look at a percentage of the overall income yeah. on the property, and the seventy five percent takes you out anyway. And again, if anybody wants to learn more about self-sufficiency, there's a video on that. But, um, but yeah, uh, the point is, and again, I don't want to make. I'm trying not to make this too, uh, too complicated. The point is, and to the question, you can be as creative as you want in these numbers. So if you're going to buy a property like this and rent a bedroom, think about it like that. 
think about where the income's gonna come from. And if you're gonna fully occupy a unit, zero the number, right? Don't plan on any income for that. Um, so we'll leave it for we'll leave it as this right now. We'll leave it as we're gonna live in a two in the two bedroom. We're gonna rent a bedroom because we have a friend or a colleague, and we're gonna and we're gonna rent out the one. Bedroom. All right. All right. Expenses. So this property tax is pulled in from public record. Um, anybody have experience with insurance on small multifamily properties? I want to take a guess at what we would put here. Annual twenty four hundred. Anybody agree or disagree with that? Pretty close, I like it. Would you even I do know too, unless I like that number a lot. What? Would you even know unless you've done it? Um, you could get, so how would you How would you go about, if you didn't know that, how could you get that answer? Do you know anybody? I mean, I'd call them up. Do you know anybody? I'd call them up, 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 I'd I find, I actually use, tra for small multifamily, non-commercial, I use Geico and Travelers. So Travelers is partnered with Geico. They're exceptional to work with. Their prices are really good. You can get a quote, you could call them up and be like, I'm buying 24 Taylor Street in Waltham. Can you give me a quote on this? Yeah. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to prove that you're actually buying it. And in 10 minutes, they're gonna give you a number. So, you know, be resourceful, call people. Um, but yeah, I like 2400, it's a good, a, a good number. If you get into commercial properties, this, this number goes way up. But for small multifamily, owner-occupied stuff, that's a really good number. Way up and you gotta pay all in. All right, Ryan, repairs, maintenance, this, you were, you were all over this earlier. So. One million dollars. <laughs> these are, so just to be clear, these are percentages of gross rents. Oh. So typically, typically, vi repairs, vacancy, and capex are, are from an underwriting perspective, which is what we're doing right now, from an estimation perspective, are, they're captured as percentage of, of income or gross rents. And the way we like to think about it is, if a building is in disrepair, like this, this needs a lot of work, we would ratchet our numbers up. If a building is turnkey, was new construction, was just recently renovated, um, otherwise in really good condition, you would bring these numbers down, right? So what do we want to use for repairs and maintenance? Anybody know what some some normal numbers would be, standard numbers? Five, 10. Five or 10%, yep. I think 10's on the high side in this market, because again, it's a percentage of of rents, um, that can get to be a very large number. Uh, with you know, if you're bringing in seven or eight thousand or nine thousand dollars a month in rent, um, but yeah, you could go as high as ten percent. What do we want to do? Building looks like it's kind of in rough shape. Should we do like seven or eight percent? Eight. Okay. Vacancy. Anybody know what standard kind of vacancy is in the Boston area lately? The last couple of years. What does that mean? That is um, the percentage of the time that you have a vacant unit in which you are not bringing in income. In this instance, it's 100%. It's gonna be down. Yeah, I, I, I know, I'm asking everybody to be creative, right? So we picked a random property. I could have staged this with a property that worked perfectly. And it, it, this is not, right? We went, on, we went on, we picked a property. Assume we could close on this property and we could fill it with tenants day one, right? But over the course of the first year or any given year, what percentage of the time do we think we wouldn't have tenants? Five. Five. Boston tracks to about 2.5 to 3% right now. I use, in Boston I use 3% and I feel pretty comfortable about that. I could do five though, so we'll do five. And then CapEx, so Heather asked this question earlier, does anybody know what, what the difference between CapEx is and repairs and maintenance? Like roofs, boilers, like big, big hefty expenses where repairs is kind of surface level? Yeah, exactly. So, so items that have life expectancy to them, exactly, roofs, heating systems, boilers, etc. 
um, that's CapEx. Um, whereas repairs and maintenance are the tenant broke the lock set, the toilet broke, um, relative operating expenses that come up from time to time. Is this like an immediate need? Like you know the roof needs to be replaced or you're just kind of preparing for when that So happens? that's how you pick the number. So that is how you estimate the number. It's the same with repairs and maintenance. If, the pro if, you, if you walk a property, if you walk it with yourself or with an agent, et cetera, and you say, this has all new heating systems, this has a new roof, this has new windows, et cetera, I would ratchet CapEx down. If I walk a property and say, oh my God, I need all, I need a budget for all new windows over the next five years, it's gonna need a new roof, it's gonna need new heating systems, like, this is gonna go up. Because I wanna make sure I'm setting the reserves aside to spend the money when the time comes, all right? So again, we'll do eight, we'll match it 8%, just like the first one. Management fees, typically uh, folks will self-manage if they're gonna live in it, they're gonna self-manage this property, so we use 0%. Electricity, what do we have to attribute for electricity in multi-families, <laughs> typically? Common areas. Common areas, yeah. I typically see like, again, depending if it's, unless it's large basements, large common areas, small, a small multi-family building, typically about $20 a month for common areas. Gas, do we use, do we have gas as an owner? Yeah. Not typically. Yeah, not typically. So most multifamilies will be sub-metered for gas. Um, tenants will pay the gas bill directly and there's typically not a common gas meter unless an owner is using it for like a hot water tank for a coin-op laundry or something like that. But again, I don't wanna to get too complex. This is typically zero. Water and sewer, typically paid by the owner in Boston. Anybody have any good uh, tactics for estimating water and sewer? Should always be paid by the owner, first off. Doesn't always have to be. Should all, doesn't have to be at all, but it should always be. As the owner, you don't want someone that's living in your building not paying their water bill and then having a problem come through. I think we're saying I different things. Much. What's You're that? saying pass the water bill to the tenant? Or? No, I'm saying the landlord, I always want to pay the water and sewer bill as the landlord. I don't. I, All right. So, so okay. Fair enough. Maybe we'll we'll table that for for yeah. later. Yeah. If you were to estimate bills, how would you do that? I call it right. sewer department. It's a good idea. Yeah. Historical. Yep. Yeah. It's a good idea. If you didn't want, have time or you wanted to just do it, typically twenty five thirty dollars per bedroom per month. If you want like quick and dirty, $25, $30 per bedroom per month is a, is a decent way to do it. Uh, but you can absolutely look up historical. So in this case, we have two, four, six bedrooms, $30 uh, a bedroom. So we'd be $180 a month for water and sewer. We wouldn't have HOA fees because we're just a small multifamily. Typically, we wouldn't have garbage either because we are gonna, that's part of our property taxes, you'll have curbside delivery in most places. Are there any other expenses we should include? Can I? Yeah. Does this calculator have expenses, like if there are more any rehab expenses that is in this calculator at all? Are there any additional rehab numbers that we So can we're using, we're using the straight up rental property. Like if you wanted to buy a, a, live, a living ready, Rental property. So we're not going to use this particular. Property. I don't want to go. Saying we're that we're already. To, we're, we're, okay. yeah. So, yeah. To the question that Heather asked earlier, you can use the Burr or the or the fix and flip rental calculators yeah. if you're going to do renovations and you're trying to boost value. Yeah. For the sake of this, we're just trying to. You're looking at a multifamily. It's ready to live in. You may or may not do cosmetic renovations. Not the point of. Gotcha. Not the point of what we're trying to do. Um, any other expenses? Landscaping, snow removal, flower. Snow, yep. baby. Land and snow. <laughs> yep. And again, this is going to vary. So, like size of lawn, size of driveway, et cetera. What would you guys use for this number? 50 to 100 a month. Yep. I think 100, I think 100 bucks a month or $1,200 a year is, is a pretty good number. Anything else? 
one other expense I would include in every multifamily. Oh, that's right. oh. What? It's a good. It's a good one. Typically, in small multis, it's covered in the taxes, so you'll have curbside. So you won't have to provide a dumpster or anything. But there is one other thing I provide in every multifamily. What about boxes? Would be covered under repairs and maintenance, oh. ancillary costs like that. Yeah. Fiction. <laughs> Wait, what do people yeah. not? What do people <laughs> not like in their apartments if they leave nice. like food everywhere? Nice, nice. Yeah, pest control. Right pest control. Um, a easy way to. I know a lot of people do not put their properties under pest control. I always do. Um, it's relatively cheap. You could do for a four family in Waltham. I'd be looking at fifty or sixty dollars a month, and you're going to head off a lot of problems proactively instead of addressing them. So, all right. So that took quite a while to go through. We took our time. We went through line by line. Um, once you do this a couple of times, um, it doesn't take that long. So once you hit finish it, or, or analyze, it spits out a number at the top. Some of you are familiar with this. Some of you are not. Okay, minus eleven $1 hundred dollars in monthly cash flow. So with our income and our expenses. We are, we are losing $1,100. Do people think that's good or bad? I'm going to let Kyle buy that one. <laughs> good or bad? Yeah. That's pretty good. I'm hearing a mixture of hurt, horrible, pretty good. <laughs> well, if you're living in it, yeah, like, that's yeah, you what you're paying less than rent. Oh, oh, right. oh, 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 yeah. Okay, I think they win. They do. Right? Yeah, they totally I don't win. think a lot of people I share that you perspective, part, but I actually think <laughs> these guys are dead on. Which is, could you rent an apartment in Walt, in this area, again, our examples in Waltham. Could you rent an apartment in Waltham for eleven hundred bucks? Nope. No this chance. is with sharing the unit, though, right? What's that? This is with sharing the unit, so you only get it, one bedroom. It was, but but we as house hackers or investors are choosing to do that. But yes, this is sharing a unit. But could you go out and rent? Maybe you could rent a bedroom for eleven hundred dollars. Maybe you have a girlfriend is that they have. But maybe <laughs> right. But like, you're not. In control of a property, you're not building equity for eleven hundred dollars. You might be able to go rent a property for seventeen, eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars, but you're but you're paying rent. And so I would look at this and say, and again, I know the property needs work. You can run this. You can run this same analysis on any number of properties. But this is you're just trying to get a sense of like, are we even in the ballpark, or are we just so far apart? Do the numbers just look so horrible? That I just need to I just need to drop this one from my list. And the idea is to run through that process very very quickly, and and get really really good at yes we should dig in more, no we shouldn't because it's just so far apart. And even if the numbers don't work, go back and edit this. I do it all the time. Okay, they're asking, you know, they were asking eight ninety nine two weeks ago. They're at eight thirty. Like there's there's room there. Right? Like these, they're willing to move, and so even if this doesn't work for you, go back, edit the report, drop the purchase price. Does it work at seven ninety nine? Does it work at seven eighty? And figure out, get used to figuring out the number that works for you, and then and then get used to you know figuring out if something's a good deal, an okay deal, or a bad deal. And the faster you can do that, and the more comfortable you are are with that the better off you're going to be as an investor. But yes, for a house hack, primary or, or, or owner-occupied multifamily, I actually think that if it was a ready-to-live-in property that was shooting off negative 1100 in cash flow, that means I'm contributing $1,100 to the mortgage every month. That's not a terrible option to own a multifamily property. The other thing you have to remember, and I remind people of this all the time, is this is incorporating your variable expenses as well, which means if you scroll down, we have fixed and variable expenses. Your fixed expenses are things like electric, gas, water, so those you're paying anyway. You're paying them every That took a little bit longer than I anticipated. That was really good though. But like, it's important stuff. Yeah. It's I've really watched, important like, stuff. I've videos on this and it didn't look at all, but this yeah. makes a lot of sense. And again, like I could pick, I could pick a number. I could pick 8% on repairs, and Gordon might pick 10 or five, like, 
the point is, is to not get paralyzed in what the number is, but just think about why am I picking this number, right? Do I want to be conservative? Do I want to be a little bit more risky? You know, risky, right? And is it is it turnkey? Does it need a lot of work? And adjust your numbers to where you feel comfortable. With it. 